So today we're going to look at granite domes and tours. But before we get into this, I want us to do a quick recap on our previous lesson, which dealt with igneous intrusions. Now I'm sure you can remember the picture over here, which actually shows us all the different intrusions. So let's quickly revise. Way down here at the bottom, we've got our magma chamber, which feeds our batholiths. And from the batholiths, we actually start feeding pipes. So here we've got a pipe moving up into a lapilith, another pipe going to a volcano. We've got a pipe that runs into a sill. So we've got a sill intrusion over here and another pipe that runs into a lacolith. Good, I hope you remember that. So now, look at granite domes. We're actually interested in our batholiths here at the bottom. So granitic domes originate from batholiths. Over time, the batholiths will cool down and crystallize into granites. And as time passes, erosion takes place and removes all the top soil layers or all the above layers and exposes the batholiths. So let's look at a quick short time lapse. So we've got our batholith over here, feeding all the different igneous intrusions. As time passes, this batholith along with all the other volcanic or igneous intrusions will start cooling down, solidifying and crystallizing. Along with that, we'll have erosion of the top soil layers. So we'll have something that looks like this. So here we've got a solidified batholith. And because it's so far below the surface of the Earth, it cooled down really slow, slowly, allowing for the crystallization of granite. OK, all the other pipes have solidified as well now. We've got some crystallized lacolith over there. And as time progresses even more, we've got further erosion of these topsoil layers, or sedimentary layers at least. And we'll end up with something like this. So as soon as your batholith is exposed on the surf surface of the Earth, we've got a granitic dome. So a granitic dome comes from a batholith. I hope you got that. Let's take a look at an example. Now, a very um, famous example from South Africa would be Paul Rock in Cape Town, or Western Cape at least. So here we've got Paul Rock. It's a very big granitic dome. Looks quite smooth on top. But if you look here at the bottom, we've got what looks like layers or weathering. And there's a specific type of weathering associated with granitic domes. But right before we look at this type of um, weathering, I want us to quickly revise another concept that we looked at in the previous lesson. And that is the different joints. So when granite cools beneath the surface of the earth, we form contractual joints. It's these vertical joints down that runs down the body of the granite. Along with that, we've got horizontal or floating joints. So as the sedimentary overlying sedimentary layers are eroded, we form offloading off joints in the granitic bodies. This allows then for a specific type of weathering called exfoliation. So how we can look at it is we can consider this big granitic dome to be something like an onion. So it's almost considered to have layers, kind of, OK? As it heats up during the day, it will expand. And as it cools down at night, it contracts. And that results in further joints forming. It completely breaks down the outer layer of the granitic dome. And this breaking usually starts along the offloading joints. And that's where exfoliation starts. So due to contraction and expansion with temperature temperature fluctuations, exfoliation will take place. And that is how granitic domes are eroded, in essence. Okay, so that was a granitic dome. Now let's take a look at the formation of tors. Now right before we jump into tors, I just quickly want to refer to tors consists of coarse stones stacked on top of each other, something like this. Okay, so these are all granitic stones stacked on top of each other. But how do they form? I want you to try and identify or see if you can identify 
We've got a little offloading joint, it seems, that runs along here. Looks like we've got a contractual joint running along there and along there. You can see my contractual joints and my offloading joints are quite evident in tors, but that still doesn't quite explain how it's formed. So now we're going to go into the process or the formation of tors, and we need to consider the fact that a batholith is buried at some point in time. And this is what we have. So we've got our big granitic batholith at the, uh, below the surface of the earth, and all along these contractual joints and offloading joints, we will find a process called chemical weathering. Now we have discussed chemical weathering in a previous lesson somewhere throughout this year. And basically what happens is these different joints act as channels which allow water to seep through it, thereby allowing chemical weathering to take place along these joints, forming core stones because eventually the stone gets chemically eroded and weathered on the outside to form these little boulders. The only thing keeping these boulders together underground is the fact that there's now fine sediments between them, which holds them together. As time passes, more erosion of the upper layers take place and eventually with something like this. So my soil has been eroded or my sedimentary layers have been eroded and all the fine materials, fine sediments that were between these core stones are eroded away as well. And we're left with granitic core stones stacked on top of each other in a weird format or a weird arrange. I hope that makes sense and I hope that you can explain it. So let's take another look at, or let's take a look at another example. So here we've got nice big core stones stacked on top of each other. Here at the bottom, we still have a bit of sediment filling the gaps. As time passes, these two will erode and weather away until we're left with just a random stacking of granitic core stones on top of each other. And this whole area over here, this is known as tors. You need to know the formation of tors. They do like asking it in the exams. So familiar yourself, familiarize yourself with it quite well. That's pretty much it for today's lesson. Um, I had a question about plateaus, mesas, and buttes, and I want us to just quickly revise how that forms. For you to fully understand how a plateau, mesa, and buttes is formed, we need to refer yet again to this little our igneous intrusions, but more specifically, the sill part. So plateaus, mesas, and buttes form because of the sill. Not exclusively, but this is a very common example. And what happens is these top sedimentary layers are completely eroded. I want you to realize that below the sill, we still have a sedimentary layer. Okay, look at the sill. It extends quite far and it can extend for kilometers and kilometers, but it does end somewhere. So here again, we've got a sedimentary edge. Okay, so what happens? My sill eventually cools down, solidifies and crystallizes. And because it's quite close to the surface of the earth, it commonly forms dolerite or basalt. It can end up forming mesa, buttes, pointed buttes, and even conical hills. Again, further backwashing will take place to erode this, part of the sedimentary rock or underlying sedimentary rock, and then scarp retreat can take place with the cap rock again. Just a quick note on the definitions. A mesa is anything that has um, a greater length than it is high. In other words, from that point to that point, if you were to measure it, it is longer or greater than moving from top to bottom. So it has a greater width than it does have height. A butte is the opposite. The width of a butte or the width of the cap rock on top of a butte is less than or shorter than the height of the butte. Very important to make that differentiation. So anything that has a width that's less than the height can be considered a butte. Again, here we have another example of a butte. The only time I have a pointed butte is when it makes a really thin point, but still it is a butte. When no cap rock is left on top, we start forming a conical hill, which will erode and weather a lot quicker than this example over here and eventually it'll form flat ground. 
I hope that clarifies that as well. Let's look at a very common example in South Africa, a very good song, and it's known as the Three Sisters. So here we've got a mesa at the back because its width is a lot bigger and a lot greater than the height. And over here, we've basically got different shaped and sized buttes. So these are all buttes, these three, the three sisters. Great. And your homework for today is just that. Not a lot of work. Have fun.